Good evening and welcome to evening prayer for Thursday, June 25th, the day the Lutheran Church commemorates the presentation of the Augsburg Confession uh, on June the 25th, 1530. So it is the 490th anniversary of that. Let's go ahead and begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To sing praise to your name, O Most High. To herald your love in the morning. Your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant, Grant this, this for, for your name's sake. Amen. Amen. Our psalm tonight is from Psalm 119, verses 41 to 48. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord. Your salvation according to your promise. Then shall I have an answer for him who taunts me. For I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth. For my hope is in your rules. I will keep your law continually. Forever and ever. And I shall walk in a wide place. For I have sought your precepts. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings. And shall not be put to shame. For I find my delight in your commandments. Which I love. I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, which I love. And I will meditate on your statutes. And that verse, uh, I will also speak of your testimonies before kings, that is right there at the beginning of the manuscript to the Augsburg Confession, uh, which is why probably this portion of this psalm was chosen for today. Our New Testament reading is from St. John's Gospel, chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. These are the post-resurrection appearances. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. 
He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had been reclining at table close to him, and said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now there were also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And our Book of Concord reading tonight is from the Large Catechism, uh, our second part on the Sacrament of the Altar. Uh, but briefly before we do that, we'll talk about the presentation of the Augsburg Confession. Uh, the Augsburg Confession, the principal doctrinal statement of the theology of Martin Luther and the Lutheran Reformers, was written largely by Philip Melanchthon. At its heart, it confesses the justification of sinners by grace alone, through faith alone, for the sake of Christ alone. Signed by leaders of many German cities and regions, the confession was formally presented to Holy Roman Emperor Charles V at Augsburg, Germany, on June 25, 1530. A few weeks later, Roman Catholic authorities rejected the confession, which Melanchthon defended in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession of 1531. In 1580, the unaltered Augsburg Confession was included in the first Book of Concord. And we pick up uh, the large catechism where we left off the night before last. This is my body and blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Briefly, that is like saying, for this reason we go to the sacrament, there we receive such a treasure by and in which we gain forgiveness of sins. Why so? Because the words stand here and give us this. Therefore Christ asks me to eat and to drink so that this treasure may be my own and may benefit me as a sure pledge and token. In fact, it is the very same treasure that is appointed for me against my sins, death, and every disaster. On this account, it is indeed called a food of the souls, which nourishes and strengthens the new man. For by baptism, we are first born anew. But as we said before, there remains in the old vicious nature of flesh and blood in mankind. There are so many hindrances and temptations of the devil and of the world that we often become weary and faint, and sometimes we also stumble. Therefore, the sacrament is given as a daily pasture and sustenance that faith may refresh and strengthen itself. Psalm 23, 1 through 3. And notice Luther there says the sacrament is given as a daily pasture and sustenance. So uh, that is a good argument for every Sunday uh, and every time we gather communion. So that it will not fall back in such a battle, but become ever stronger and stronger. The new life must be guided so that it continually increases and progresses but it must suffer much opposition. For the devil is such a furious enemy. When he sees that we oppose him and attack the old man and that he cannot topple us over by force, he prowls and moves about on all sides. He tries every trick and does not stop until he finally wears us out so that we either renounce our faith or throw up our hands and put up our feet, becoming indifferent or impatient. Now to this purpose, the comfort of the sacrament is given when the heart feels that the burden is becoming too heavy, so that it may gain here new power and refreshment. But here our wise spirits twist themselves about with their great art and wisdom. They cry out and bawl, how can bread and wine forgive sins or strengthen faith? 
They hear and know that we do not say this about bread and wine, because in itself bread is bread. But we speak about the bread and wine that is Christ's body and blood and has the words attached to it. That, we say, is truly the treasure, and nothing else, through which such forgiveness is gained. Now the only way this treasure is passed along and made our very own is in the words given and shed for you. For in the words you have both truths, that it is Christ's body and blood, and that it is yours as a treasure and gift. Now Christ's body can never be an unfruitful, empty thing that does or profits nothing. Yet, no matter how great the treasure is in itself, it must be included in the word and administered to us. Otherwise, we would never be able to know or seek it. Therefore, also, it is useless talk when they say that Christ's body and blood are not given and shed for us in the Lord's Supper, so we could not have the forgiveness of sins in this sacrament. Although the work is done and the forgiveness of sins is secured by the cross, it cannot come to us in any other way than through the word. How would we know about it otherwise that such a thing was accomplished or was to be given to us, unless it were presented by preaching or the oral word? How do they know about it? Or how can they receive and make the forgiveness their own unless they lay hold of and believe the scriptures and the gospel? But now the entire gospel and the article of the creed, I believe in the Holy Christian Church, the forgiveness of sins, and so on, are embodied by the word in this sacrament and presented to us. Why then should we let this treasure be torn from the sacrament when the fanatics must confess that these are the very words we hear everywhere in the gospel? They cannot say that these words in the sacrament are of no use, just as they dare not say that the entire gospel or God's word, apart from the sacrament, is of no use. So we have covered the entire sacrament, both what it is in itself and what it brings in profits. Now we must also see who is the person that receives this power and benefit. That is answered briefly, as we said above about baptism and often elsewhere. Whoever believes the words has what they declare and bring. For they are not spoken or proclaimed to stone and wood, but to those who hear them, to whom he says, take eat, and so on. Because he offers and promises forgiveness of sin, it cannot be received except by faith. This faith he himself demands in the word when he says, given and shed for you. As if he said, for this reason I give it, and ask you to eat and drink it, that you may claim it as yours and enjoy it. Whoever now accepts these words and believes that what they declare is true has forgiveness. But whoever does not believe it has nothing, since he allows it to be offered to him in vain, and refuses to enjoy such a saving good. The treasure indeed is opened and placed at everyone's door, Yes, upon his table. But it is necessary that you also claim it and confidently view it as the words tell you. This is the entire Christian preparation for receiving the sacrament worthily. Since this treasure is entirely presented in the words, it cannot be received and made ours in any other way than with the heart. Such a gift and eternal treasure cannot be seized with the fist. Fasting, prayer, and other such things may indeed be outward preparations and discipline for children, so that the body may keep and bring itself modestly and reverently to receive Christ's body and blood. Yet the body cannot seize and make its own what is given in and with the sacrament. This is done by faith in the heart, which discerns this treasure and desires it. This may be enough for what is necessary as a general instruction about the sacrament. What may be said about it further belongs to another time. In conclusion, since we now have the true understanding and doctrine of the sacrament, there is also need for some admonition and encouragement. Then people may not let such a great treasure, daily administered and distributed among Christians, pass by unnoticed. So those who want to be Christians may prepare to receive this praiseworthy sacrament often. For we see that people seem weary and lazy about receiving the sacrament. A great multitude hears the gospel, yet because the nonsense of the Pope has been abolished and we are freed from his laws and coercion, they go one, two, three years, or even longer without the sacrament. They act as though they were such strong Christians that they have no need of it. Some allow themselves to be hindered and held up by the excuse that we have taught that no one should approach the sacrament except those who feel hunger and thirst, which drive them to it. Some pretend that it is a matter of liberty and not necessary. They pretend that it is enough to believe without it. For the most part, they go so far astray that they become quite brutish and finally despise both the sacrament and God's word. 
Now it is true, as we have said, that no one should by any means be forced or compelled to go to the sacrament, lest we institute a new murdering of souls. Nevertheless, it must be known that people who deprive themselves of and withdraw from the sacrament for such a long time are not to be considered Christians. For Christ has not instituted to be treated as a show. Instead, he has commanded his Christians to eat it, drink it, and remember him by it. Indeed, those who are true Christians and value the sacrament precious and holy will drive and move themselves to go to it. We will present something on this point so that the simple-minded and the weak, who would also like to be Christians, may be more stirred up to consider the cause and need that ought to move them. In other matters, applying to faith, love, and patience, it is not enough to teach and instruct alone. There is also need for daily encouragement, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. So here also there is need for us to continue to preach so that people may not become weary and disgusted. For we know and feel how the devil always opposes this in every Christian exercise. He drives and deters people from them as much as he can. And we'll pick this back up. Uh, today's Thursday, tomorrow night. We join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it is not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And as always, the Thursday prayer focuses on the Lord's Supper. O Lord Jesus Christ, true King of heaven and earth, you promised to your church that the gates of hell would not prevail against her, and you still cause your word to be preached and your holy sacraments to be administered among us. But ah, O Lord, the sins of your people obscure the majesty of your bride. Your holy vineyard is trampled and your blessed sacrifice stands neglected. Many think themselves strong and despise the life-giving food that you have ordained for your people for the forgiveness of their sins. Pardon all our arrogance and do not come to us in wrath to remove the lamp of your word from before our eyes. O Lord, we pray you, visit this vine which you once established for yourself and renew us with the sun of your mercy and the water of eternal life. Give us a great hunger for the food of your true body and blood and let all your faithful people ever be found in the apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of your bread and in the prayers. We implore you, O Lord, for our altar, that it may ever be a place where the medicine of eternal life, the forgiveness of our sins, strengthens us in body and soul, that disbelief and impenitence may stay far from all who come there, so that they may not eat and drink to their own judgment. O eternal High Priest, let the fruit of your Spirit grow in us, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and chastity. Cause us to live in holy conduct toward one another to the glory of your holy name, here in time and hereafter in eternity. For you live and reign with the Father and the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you preserve the teaching of the Apostolic Church through the confession of the true faith at Augsburg. Continue to cast the bright beams of your light upon your church that we, being instructed by the doctrine of the blessed apostles, may walk in the light of your truth and finally to attain the light of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Amen. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Heavenly Father, Father, through Jesus Jesus Christ, Christ, your dear dear Son, son, that you have graciously graciously kept me this day. day. And And I I pray pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and and graciously keep me this night. For into into your hands hands I commend myself, my body body and soul soul and all things. things. Let your your holy angel be with me, that the evil evil foe foe may have have no no power power over me. me. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. Good night.